our moderator, Brenda Perea, I have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to go through. First, thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like to follow the conversation, conversation on Twitter, please do so by using the hashtag BadgesCC. It's at the bottom of all of our slides in case you forget that. Also, don't forget to drop your questions in the chat during the broadcast so our panel of experts can answer them at the end of the presentation. If for some reason we don't get to your questions, all of the contact information from our panelists will be in the slides, so you can feel free to reach out after the broadcast. Um, lastly, upon conclusion of today's recording, all of our participants are going to get an email with a copy of our slide deck and a recording. I'd like to introduce you to our panelists today. We have Mike Macklin, uh, the Associate Provost for Workforce Development at the Colorado Community College System. We have Kim Moore, the Director of Workforce Professional and Communi Community Education at Wichita State. And we have Brenda Perea, Director of Education and Workforce Strategies at Credley. Brenda, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you've joined us in a conversation about the impact of digital credentials can have on the workforce pipeline. Before we dive into our conversation, I want to share a bit about what is happening nationally and internationally in this space. According to the latest ADACOPO staffing survey, 54% of those executives say that education system doesn't teach the skills needed for today's workforce. Also, Katie Bar Barrow, Vice President of data analytics at Payscale stated, we hear all the time about the skills gap, the gap between the skills needed to succeed in the professional world and the skills in which young professionals leave college. The data we've collected show that even though their education may make recent graduates feel prepared to enter the workforce, only half of hiring managers agree with them. Managers feel crucial skills in recent graduates are frequently lacking or absent. It's really interesting in the fact that we have all been working towards preparing everyone, youth and adult, to enter the workforce, and somehow there's a gap happening. I'm not sure if the audience is aware of the July 19th, 2018 executive order establishing the President's National Council for the American Worker. In short, it states, our nation is facing a skills crisis. There are currently more than 6.7 million unfilled jobs in the United States, and the American workers, who are our country's most valuable resource, need the skills training to fill them. At the same time, the economy is changing at a rapid pace because of technology automation and artificial intelligence that is shaping many industries, from manufacturing to healthcare and retail. For too long, our country's education and job training programs have prepared Americans for the economy of the past. The rapidly changing digital economy requires the United States to view education and training as encompassing more than a single period of time in a traditional classroom. We need to prepare Americans for the 21st century economy and the emerging industries of the future. We must foster an environment of lifelong learning and skills-based training and cultivate a demand-driven approach to workforce. That's a really great vision for how American workforce needs to start changing and adapting to meet both the learner-earner as well as the workers and the employers of the future. If we take a look at the recent AAC you survey, when it comes to the types of skills and knowledge that employers feel are most important to workplace success, a large major majority of employers do not feel that recent college graduates are well prepared. This is particularly in the case for applying knowledge and skills in real world settings, critical thinking skills and written and oral communication skills, areas in which fewer than three in 10 employers think that re recent college graduates are well prepared, even in the areas of ethical decision making and working with others in teams. Many employers do not give graduates high marks. When I was at Colorado Community College System, we came across this all the time. Our employers were saying, we can't hire your students because they can't perform something. When we looked at our actual curriculum, our students were actually learning that. So there was definitely a gap between what, what was actually happening and what they thought was happening. It was really interesting in the fact that as we worked on our curriculum and tried to get everything going, we found that we were not communicating in the same language to fill that communications gap. So if we look at the Manpower Group 2018 Talent Shortage Survey, it states that global talent is at a 12-year high with strengthening global economy. Employers are more optimistic about hiring, yet we know emerging technology and changing skills are leaving employers with unfilled roles. And how do we actually work on that? We found that digital credentials meet that gap 
create that close that gap between the communication of what people can actually do and perform on a job site and what employers are asking for. When we look in Argentina, they just re recently re released their Think 20 report. In that report, they conclude that critical skills in te today's technology are facing an accelerated process of relevance and redefinition. This landscape requires the country to address interrelated factors as the increasing distance between formal education, i.e. at the secondary level there in Argentina, and the employer labor market needs, the need to provide flexible and lifelong learning opportunities for upskilling and reskilling the workforce, as well as rethinking the relevance and future role of former education and knowledge, similar to what our president's executive degree decree states, but they've taken a little bit further. In their Vision 1C statement, it's time to adopt new parameters and tools for validating and recognition. It is necessary to move away from traditional forms of classifying and certifying learning, whether it's formal, non-formal, informal, towards new ways of valuing learning. Having this in mind, alternative and more flexible credentialing and licensing tools can be issued regardless of the settings in which the learning happens. This can enrich context, encourage flexibility, and mobility of those who want to acquire new knowledge or skill without sacrificing the recognition needed in the workforce. So if we take it further afield, if we go to Scotland, you'll notice up on the screen is that we have very specific social services badges that the, the country of Scotland is now issuing, issuing inside their social se services sector. These badges are used to provide recognition for non-certified learning, incentivize employee learning while steering and encouraging the behavior for the workforce of the future. Rob Stewart, Learning and Development Advisor, ensured that the social services badges focused on authentic assessment attributes, performing a task, real life experience, construction and application of theories and skills relating to social services, learner focused and all badges require direct evidence of skill attainment. That's why these are so popular in Scotland. If we go ahead and look at what's happening in um, Normandy, Normandy has a public and private agricultural ex education system in Normandy. The academic side is separate from the agriculture side. So they're leading a series of digital badge projects dedicated to giving meaning to learning, reinforcing learners' personal career projects, recognizing and validating learning achievements, formal and informal. This countrywide project for digital badges has specific workforce goals. First, it's facilitating the recognition and validation of skills and learning, formal and informal, needed in the agricultural education environment. They are preparing learners for lifelong learning. It means once you graduate from their program, your learning doesn't stop. You need to be constantly learning to keep up with the agribusiness in Normandy. They are identifying emerging skills and connecting those skills with the job market. So they're future thinking, thinking about how digital credentials can actually future proof the skills that are needed for their agribusiness. And they are also implementing many digital tools to foster the learner's ability to act autonomously. It, meaning that if I want to actually go into hydroponics, I, there are ways out there in Normandy, I can actually go in and learn about hydroponics get certified in hydroponics with using digital badges and actually use that in the workforce. So in order to facilitate this countrywide implementation of digital badges and ensure it's open to all the stakeholders, Badges Normandy has three distinct projects. The first projects are Normandy Agriculture Education Badges, Recognition of Informal Learning, Citizenship Engagement, Normandy Agroecology Badges, recognition and of validating the innovative practices in agroecology and badges for the youth, recognition of people and training programs within a regional educational policies that feed up into the larger agribusiness. With these badges, they're impacting their agricultural educations in water management, landscape management, agronomy, services to individuals, and zoo technics. If we look actually closer to home, here in the United States, 
Rhode Island has taken a really large step in using digital credentials to impact their workforce. If we look at Rhode Island, what they've done is they've taken on the task of identifying workforce needed competencies and providing pathways into employment. The state of Rhode Island, Island is unique in that they released a series of 21st century skill badges. Education and training is offered for any resident to earn the badges to increase their ability to be employed. The city of Providence has taken this a step further. Any youth aged 16 to 20 and our Providence residents who earn the digital badges was extended an offer of a summer job for the summer of 2018 through Workforce Solutions, which is the city of Providence office. Workforce Solutions offered a variety of summer youth employment opportunities to over 500 Providence youth. By earning the Rhode Island 21st Century Badges, youth qualified to be the first in line for one of several career-oriented po positions offered by a host of community organizations and businesses. Youth who earned badges but were not Providence residents received a letter of recommendation from the City of Providence for summer employment through their local workforce board. So not only did they help throughout the state of Rhode Island establish what they considered were 21st century skills, those actual digital badges, earning those badges, allowed youth to be employed either in the City of Providence or through their local workforce board. Very, very advanced thinking on how to actually employ youth and get them in the workforce. When we're talking about digital badges uh, and back into, if we're talking about academic areas and how digital badges work to create opportunities for our students to enter the workforce well-equipped, if we look at Northeastern State Community College in DePaul, their finding alignment between the student skills acquisition and goal setting has an incredible potential to reduce the turnover and decrease hiring costs for employers. But that means that they actually have to identify those skills and those that are important to employers to prevent that churn. North, Northeast State Community College states that the education and business community speak different languages in a sense. The onus is on the employers to provide clear cut information on what jobs are most critical for their businesses, what competencies are needed to fill those jobs, and what pathways provide them with the best talent. We, on the other hand, need to use digital badges to effectively communicate the competencies and pathways to employers and badge earners. And DePaul University states, being intentional about competencies and linking experiences to career pathways when building or revising programs, keeping in the end in mind that credentials and experiences students have inside the institution must translate to real world workforce opportunities. So with that background and how digital credentials are increasing workforce opportunities, I would like to bring in our exper expert panelists to expand on the workforce digital credential conversation. First of all, I wanted to start the conversation with Michael Macklin of Colorado Community College System and formerly of Colorado State University. Mike, I know you were one of the pioneers in the state of Colorado to develop workforce-centric digital badges to new skill, reskill, or upskill adults in Colorado. Can you tell me a little bit about the opportunities workforce digital badges provide and their ability to impact the employment pipeline? Yeah, of course. Thanks so much, Brenda. Um, so I think where we'll start is we'll look at some of the badges that we worked on at Colorado State University. Um, Colorado State was joined the badge conversation in 2012 and when we were there what we did is we uh, looked at a statewide curriculum that was quite popular and quite successful um, but tried to figure out how we could reach a broader audience and address some of those workforce needs so what we did is we actually unbundled a curriculum into more granular competencies and discrete skills uh, those things that could be directly applied to a job um, so when we did that, one of the things that we looked at was kind of that iTunes model of education. So instead of taking the full 16-week course, could you take a one-week course um, that was a specific skill set perhaps for a job that you were doing, uh, pruning, um, tree identification, that sort of thing. Um, and then we did scaffold those back together just in case someone wanted to kind of upskill from there. We also tied the pricing 
of those badges to a very similar structure. So you could think of a cable provider um, where you bundle different things together and get a price difference. From there, we uh, recognize that the workforce is looking for something that they can get on demand. So these courses are online um, and required some sort of practical lab assessment or simulation work. Um, they're designed to be affordable and they are open for registration 24 by 7 by 365. Uh, when we look um, at the industry adoption of it, I would not say that there's full industry adoption. However, I do have some isolated success stories of industry and business implementation. Uh, probably the first one would be there was a landscaper in Fort Collins who interestingly asked me for um, a bigger image of one of the badges. And what he did is after completing the full program, uh, he actually printed that badge off on a magnet and put that on his vehicles as a, a sign of mastery and kind of a recognition of higher learning and credentialing. I think another interesting one in Colorado is there's a city and county who at the time were offering an hourly wage bump um, if you were to go back and complete these courses. And I think the, the final one that was really interesting and was truly organic, no pun intended, um, was the there was a local business who used one of the entry level badges, the How Plants Grow badge, um, as an onboarding requirement. So before a person could work in the nursery, uh, they actually had to take that badge as an onboarding. Um, in January, I joined the Colorado Community College System and picked up on some of the great work that Brenda and her team had started. Uh, when we look at the Colorado Community College system, I think there's really kind of three themes that we structure our badges around. Um, I would say that there's customized instrument control or kind of technician focused badges. So those would be like the Sundang badge. Um, so specific to a specific tool and company um, that a technician could get expertise on. I think the next bucket is probably industry specific or sector specific. Uh, those are often driven by talent shortages or as Brenda mentioned, kind of misconnected pathways between the academic setting and the business competencies. Those we have badges in welding, machining, heavy operation or heavy equipment operation. Um, and then I think that last bucket is probably uh, what I would consider education development or educator development. Those you'll see faculty development badges. Um, we had a collaboration recently with the University of Colorado Boulder where there was a teacher training on the world of business. Um, I think that's a critical component to a badge strategy as we start looking at changing some of the narratives in the academic space, getting that buy-in from faculty and instructors as a critical component along with that engagement of business. Mike, that sounds really super interesting. Um, so just as a, a question, have you actually, when you had your experience with the uh, agriculture badges and now that you're at CCCS with employer-driven badges, how are you actually seeing those badges being much more um, engaging for employers? Um, how do you actually get buy-in from employers for your digital badges? Yeah, I think that's probably one of the uh, the toughest parts for anybody diving into this space or anyone who's been into this space. I think that the critical component is actually requiring that um, is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I had an interruption there. Um, it is actually requiring that. Um, businesses be at the table and informing the conversation as we're building those coursework and that curriculum. Um, that's a really critical component because if they're invested in the front end, their willingness to adopt and kind of accept those badges moving into the future will be increased. Awesome. So what I hear you saying is <clears throat> if you're inviting employers into the the space where you're doing, you're developing the training 
or educational programs, they then become invested in the output, which is your students. And since they have been a part of creating not only the content or the training or giving you competencies that need to happen inside that, when they're seeing these digital badges that they themselves have contributed to, they are more likely to actually accept those as hiring potential for either upskilling, reskilling, or new skilling badges, not only with applicants they're hiring, but considering Colorado Community College System or Colorado State University as one of their training partners because they can know what actually happens inside their field. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for that. It's really great hearing what's happening out in the field on the employer business uh, educational partnership. Um, so what I'd like to do now is move over to Kansas. I'd like to bring in Kim Moore from Wichita State University to help me understand what's going on uh, in WSU, uh, Wichita State University's efforts to create lifelong and lifewide learning, um, which is allowing Wichita State University's digital credentials to provide a pathway of workforce ready education and training. Kim, we know in meeting the future work and educational needs in the digital age, <clears throat> it is important to adopt new parameters and tools for validation and recognition on how employers responded to each of your institutional digital budget initiatives. Kim, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, WSU is doing in the digital badge space in the workforce pipelines? Uh, thank you, Brenda. Um, well, compared to Colorado State, we are relatively newcomers to badges. Um, I've been involved with badges for the last three years since 2015. Uh, we started our badge program in 2015 with one badge and two uh, participants. And uh, last by last fall, we were up to 41 badges, and we had over 584 uh, students participating in badges. And we're adding another 20 badges this fall, so we will have approximately 63 badges, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, uh, available for um, our students to take. They're all online, so they're available. We have uh, international students even taking our badges. So our badge courses are online uh, credit courses of one credit hour or less, again, for undergraduate or graduate credit. They are designed for non-degree seeking students. Our regular degree bound students are not yet eligible to take a badge course. So that makes them a little bit different than what other uh, educational institutions are doing. The badges are self paced. So for fall, a student can begin a badge course uh, from uh, August clear up until Thanksgiving. And they must complete the coursework by December 13th. So there's a lot of flexibility for busy, busy working professionals that have other commitments uh, and things going on in their lives. So uh, that makes badges ideal for the working professional. Um, they're graded pass-fail. So you either get a grade of a BG badge granted or NBG no badge granted. So um, they really are designed to be flexible uh, for a working professional. And we also price them using market-based tuition. So I have the flexibility to set tuition individually for these badges based on uh, competition and what the market will bear, what people are willing to pay for, for the education. So unlike traditional education programs, there is so much flexibility that makes them accessible and affordable for the working adult. So Kim, what I hear you saying is that digital badges connect learners to employers and employers to badge earners. But I noticed that WSU is also has specific training for lifelong and lifewide learning in the form of WSU's community education badges and outreach services in the senior community. Can you expand upon the program and if a program such as that sh should or would be considered for some form of credentialing if there are demands for upskilling, reskilling, or new skilling in this new labor pool of senior adult workers? And one of the reasons I'm asking it about that is where I live here in Colorado, uh, there is a shortage of youth workers. So we're finding that for businesses to staff for summer hiring, they are actually hiring people who are 58 and older um, for filling those 
typical youth jobs. Um, so can you give me some information on your uh, community badging initiatives? Uh, certainly, Brenda. Um, our lifelong learning program is very, very popular. We have over 500 students uh, per semester that enroll in these courses. And while we don't currently badge them, I certainly think that that is an opportunity for the future. Um, these courses are actual credit courses worth a uh, half credit hour, um, and they are um, audited by senior citizens. But the senior citizens are very, very excited about some of them earning college credit for the very first time. And so I think uh, while we don't currently badge these courses, there certainly is an opportunity for that. And I think um, giving them a recognized credential would be appropriate and would uh, certainly help them in the job market. Um, the programs, um, the students don't pay tuition and fees because they are scholarship by the Board of Regents. And so um, they are very, very affordable. We hold them at senior centers and senior residential facilities. So again, they're accessible. Just like all of our badge courses, accessibility and affordability are foremost um, in our minds, as well as um, all of our courses, badge courses and lifelong learning, have to meet the requirements of the Higher Learning Commission, HLC, um, who accredits, credits um, our university. And so what we're offering in both instances is very high quality education that when people, whether they be employers or others are looking at the courses, they um, can verify that they um, are quality, that they've met, um, that they have measurable learning outcomes in both instances of badges and lifelong learning, and that um, they are taught by qualified faculty. So um, both of these programs are really ideal for demonstrating how universities are approaching higher education differently these days in looking at learner-centered learning that um, is, has a demonstrated value um, because in both instances there are competencies and learning outcomes um, that have to be met in order for these learners to get a badge or to um, successfully complete the coursework. Thanks a lot for that, Kim. I have a question. If we go back to your um, your badges that are that are not community based for, but I noticed that you have uh, new employer specific badges such as the Care of Populations in Public Health, German uh, Introduction to Criminal Justice, Biomedical. Can you tell me uh, a little bit about how do you get employers engaged in digital badges that are very specific to the workforce? Well, as Mike referenced in his remarks. Um, it's really important to have employers at the table um, and also to work with your local groups like your Chamber of Commerce, our Workforce Alliance group, our Business and Education Alliance. Um, I participate in all of those meetings. I listen to what they're saying, uh, what their needs are. Again, um, as you've referenced, soft skills are utmost uh, in employers' minds these days and, and something that appears to be lacking in uh, college graduates overall. And so listening and having those folks at the table, in the instance of the CARA Population Badge Series, which was our very first set of badges, I worked with the Kansas Public Health Association as well as the Kansas Department of Health and Environment uh, and our public health um, science faculty. And we uh, listened to what was going on uh, in, in the workforce. We tied these badges to public health accreditation to tier one of public health accreditation. So we knew that they were meeting a need in health departments, both in the state of Kansas and nationwide. Um, in terms of criminal justice, we have over 1,300 job openings in corrections in the state of Kansas. And there is a demonstrated need for people to go into the field of criminal justice. And so um, we looked at Department of Labor statistics. We listened to what our Workforce Alliance partners were saying. And we also um, talk to our criminal justice faculty. And so what we're doing with the criminal justice badges is we are offering them to high school students as well as working professionals looking for a career change, hoping that at the high school level that we are introducing high school students to the criminal justice profession 
that will then they will become a pipeline um, by taking these badges um, for the to, to meet the needs in in the criminal justice community. And so our criminal justice badge is stacked to the equivalent of our CJ191, which is a required course for all criminal justice majors. So if a student comes back to the university as a degree-bound student, they can pull that coursework over and they've already met that requirement for a criminal justice degree. So we have some really exciting things going on. Um, our German badges were developed at the request of an international aircraft manufacturer located in Wichita and they do a lot of international business, so we are developing German badges to be followed by French and Spanish um, badges that will help their workers when they're traveling um, in Europe to be able to communicate um, with um, the folks over there. And we're um, adapting those badges based on what their needs are to include um, also not just the language, but also customs and, and social norms. So that, uh, again, we are uh, meeting, directly meeting the needs of employers in our area. That sounds super. Um, we are getting some questions in from the audience. And so, um, Kim, one of the questions was, um, do these badges that, that are on the screen now carry college credit? And what I heard you saying is, is that your criminal justice badges definitely stack up to your criminal justice. I think it was 191. What about your other badges? Yes, all of these badges are for college credit. So we offer college credit both at the undergraduate and graduate level. It depends on the badges. An example is our um, school health badges. We offer those uh, for master's level credit because they are designed for school nurse and other school health professionals that already have degrees. School nurses in Kansas, much like educators, have to have advanced education in order to um, advance on the pay scale. They have to have master's level credit. So in working with the Kansas School Nurse Organization, we identified what the need was. And so um, they can earn graduate credit for school health badges. And so there's an example of, of how that is meeting a, a need of both employees and school districts. Awesome. We do have a question again, Kim, for who writes and designs and teaches the lifelong learning courses at WSU? Um, those are actually um, faculty. Faculty develop the courses and faculty teach the courses. So they may be a full-time faculty member or a department um, adjunct, and we have both teaching in the lifelong learning program but they have to meet the requirements of the Higher Learning Commission in order to teach the courses. That sounds really fascinating on that. It, it, that's really forward thinking for what's happening in the higher education space today. Um, I'm gonna turn a question over to Mike Macklin. Uh, we had a question that came in for Colorado Community College System. They noticed the fact that um, most of the, the badges that are showing on the screen now happen to be Colorado Community College System, but there are two badges, one an Adams County Educational Consortium badge, as well as a CU Boulder, is it? Uh, business, World of Business badge. Could you uh, explain a little bit about those badges? Yeah, so um, this is also something that we were able to do at Colorado State, but one of the things that we recognized early on, and I think that Colorado has recognized this, um, that an ecosystem of collaboration is really quite critical. And so the two badges that were referenced in the question, so the Adams County Education Consortium and the CU Boulder um, badge were collaborations with the community college system and subject matter experts to specifically address a particular need. Um, and so the Adams County one, um, what they were recognizing was the pathway into um, financial institutions was usually driven by some sort of bachelor's degree or something to that effect. And realistically, what they were looking for is a specific set of skills, financial literacy, customer service, more of those soft skills that we had kind of chatted about. So um, that was intended to be a pathway into those careers and those jobs in that particular county. Um, and then the CU Boulder um, badge, again, was a collaboration with Lead School of Design and our program director of business um, and our career and technical education, where 
you know, can we start aligning community college business courses with um, university business courses? So that one was one of the educator preparation badges that I mentioned. That sounds fascinating. Thank you very much for that answer. So what I hear you saying is not only is Colorado Community College System working within their 13 colleges, but they're also doing outreach to Adams County and helping their K through 12 uh, upskill and reskill themselves into the workforce, as well as looking at a pathway, let's say an educational pathway for somebody to go from K through 12 to two year to four year and gain badges along the way to actually make them more valuable inside the workplace. I really appreciate that uh, elaboration on those two badges. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, we're gonna go ahead and turn to the question and answer section since we have about a little more than 20 minutes left and it looks like that we're getting a lot of questions in. I have a question for, two questions for Kim. What is the average price of a one credit badge? And also one, um, so I'll let Kim answer that. What is the average price of a one credit badge? I know you said you have the latitude of having market driven tuition on those badges. Can you uh, just elaborate a little bit on what would you consider an average price for a badge? An average price for a half credit hour badge, uh, half credit undergraduate badge would be $100, would be an average cost. And it should be noted that that's the full cost. So that's tuition fees. And uh, our badges do not require textbooks. So we use open educational resources that are built into the online course. So that makes them extremely affordable um, because textbooks can be quite expensive. What we learned early on is we had a $100 badge and a $150 textbook that went with it. Well, we knew that wasn't going to work. And so we redesigned the course and we looked for open educational resources and we built those into the course and eliminated that cost. Uh, our graduate badges um, and one credit hour badges are approximately in the $200 range. Um, so that would be for like a one credit hour graduate badge. Awesome. Uh, a question comes in, um, do badges have an expiration date and are they renewable? I'm gonna throw that question over to Mike. Yeah, so um, the badges that we created at both of those institutions um, have the option to expire. And part of that is um, a collaboration with the industry or the subject matter experts. You know, there's certain disciplines that may not change a lot in what they're teaching, but then there are other ones where if the technology changes in a tool or if there's new welding um, processes and techniques out there, we want to keep the, the curriculum very dynamic and relevant. Um, so we do, um, in those instances, go ahead and expire those badges and require um, someone to come back and uh, retake or take the new version of the curriculum that's out there. Really trying to, again, respond to industry needs and the changes in the disciplines. Awesome. Thanks for that answer. We have a question that's come in that's both uh, relevant to both Mike and Kim, and one of it is, what is the purpose does a badge serve when you're already giving college credit on a transcript or, or a resume? And I know I confront this question all the time. Uh, about why give a digital badge if you're transcripting stuff. Uh, Kim, can you go ahead and answer that question first and then we'll go over back to Mike? Well, badges tell a different story than traditional college credit. So if you earn an A or a B or a C in a course, what does that really tell the employer? If you earn a badge, it's linked to competencies uh, and outcomes that you can, uh, an employer can click on the badge and they can drill down into, and it tells the employer exactly what that badge earner knows and what they can do, what skills do they possess. So it provides a lot more knowledge than a traditional college transcript, and that's what makes it so valuable. Thanks, Kim. Let me actually change that question just a bit uh, for Mike. Mike, we know that Colorado Community College Systems uh, intentionally made sure that their badges were not gonna be uh, a duplicate of a course, a certificate, or a degree. However, think about this. If you could a badge be given for a group or a series of, say, competencies, um, and then, so 
you have a series of, of let's say learning outcomes you group them together and you badge them um, so it could theoretically kind of be equivalent to a certificate but what happens if you're trying to do this in the non-academic curriculum space kind of like um, what's happening in student support services you have student clubs you have leadership you have volunteer opportunities can you kind of explain how that would work and why uh, having a digital badge would be more worthwhile for an employer rather than just a transcript yeah so i think um for me the the value comes from the metadata and the options um, that the badge allows, um, much like Kim was saying. So the transcript represents a grade for a course, whereas the badge could represent a level of mastery um, in a specific skill set or competency. I think one of the other promising practices that I'm seeing from an industry standpoint is, you know, a an A, a B, a C, a D uh, in a course is much different than a recorded video of a student um, doing a task and using that as evidence attached to the badge. Um, I also think there's opportunities. I don't think that badges and credit are mutually exclusive. Um, I, I use the example sometimes of, you know, if two MBAs um, are applying for the same job, but one of them has a series of badges in graphic design or um, computer coding, does that set them apart from their peer? Um, and I would argue that there is um, that differentiating factor that you can utilize those badges um, to kind of show a difference on the resume um, in what's currently there. Awesome. Thank you. I have a question that's coming in and it's a basically a two part question is typically what is the composition of a team that creates these badges? Does it include a subject matter expert, an instructional designer, a graphic designer? What Mike, what is typically your team that actually develops these badges? Yeah, so that was um, um, your framing was right on. Um, so if we kind of look at the batch development process I've used in the past, um, that first step being um, working with the industry and going through an exercise of identifying needs and gaps from there, um, utilizing a subject matter expert, and that could be um, in-house faculty. Um, it could also be industry professionals. Um, I think that um, we can utilize either of those as a subject matter expert. I think that next layer is a critical one, and that's the instructional design support. Um, the subject matter experts, especially if you're working with industry, you're often not teachers or instructors, and so utilizing someone who has expertise in building learning objectives and meaningful assessments is critical. Um, and then kind of that last piece I look at is some functional way to um, map competencies and where appropriate um, crosswalk goes back to credit. Um, so subject matter expert, instructional design, and usually some sort of program manager, business development type person. That sounds great. Kim, can you tell us how um, your team is that creates digital badges at Wichita, please? Well, it's very much like Mike mentioned. Um, so our team that creates the badges we start working with the faculty and the um, department chair and the dean of the college, and we get them involved in the development process uh, once we have uh, an employer that comes to us with, with a need. And then uh, our instructional design team uh, works one-on-one -on -one with the faculty member, and they're, they, we have a template that all badges follow, and so the instructional design team works with the faculty member to develop the course, the course syllabus, um, and get it into Blackboard. And we um, also, our team uh, involves um, the registrar's office, our admissions office, uh, our international office, our international student office. Um, we triage our badges. So when we get a badge interest form, if it's an international student, we work with our international office um, to get those students admitted and enrolled. The high school student, we work with our admissions office to get the students admitted and enrolled. And then my office focuses on all professionals. 
and we work with admissions and the registrar's office on that enrollment process. Um, we work with our strategic communications department in helping to market the badges. So we have um, all aspects of the university uh, involved in the badge development and uh, execution. Thanks so much. I have a question that's coming in from the audience and saying, <clears throat> for both Mike and Kim, do employers have the ability to validate digital badges? And I'm not, it, I'm not exactly sure because most digital badges you can actually are one of the forms of characteristics is you validate not only the issuer, but the earner who's actually earned that badge. But also, are you currently working with workforce development in your areas and have there been um, do you know if uh, WIOA funds are available to actually claim these digital badges? So first question, do employers have the ability to validate digital badges? And second question, are you working with workforce development in your areas for this type of credentialing? And can these badges be paid using WIOA funds? We'll go ahead and turn that over to Mike first. Yeah, thanks. And so you're absolutely right. I mean, there are um, a lot of the badge providers um, out there, at least specifically, allows for employer valid, um, validation. Um, so when you issue that to a person, I can verify that that went to Brenda and that that's not a, um, you know, a counterfeit badge um, based on the metadata and the validation against um, the URL that comes along with that. Um, as for working with workforce partners, uh, absolutely. Um, ironically, I'm sitting in beautiful Vail, Colorado at a workforce development conference right now where we'll be talking with different workforce centers um, and workforce center representatives. Um, and one of the things that they do do is they are able to list in the, the eligible training provider list, uh, ETPL, um, they are able to list these programs on there um, and where appropriate funding can be applied to that. Awesome. Kim, can you talk about uh, employer validating the badge as well as um, working with your workforce development center as well as um, whether WIOA funds can be used for these digital credentials? The validation process is much like Mike mentioned. Um, because they're university courses they, and they have to meet all Higher Learning Commission requirements, that helps to validate the, the courses. They're also in Blackboard, and so our instructors validate that the students successfully completed each aspect of the badge. Our students have to have a pass rate of 80 to 85 percent on all um, coursework in order to receive the badge and so we verify that and it wouldn't go on their transcript unless they um, or they wouldn't earn the badge unless they successfully uh, achieve those um, standards and we work with also our um, local statewide um, licensing boards and agencies to make sure that all of the requirements um, professional requirements that they require for a person to earn contact hours in addition to college credit are met. So if it's uh, a nursing uh, health care badge, we make sure we work with the Kansas State Board of Nursing to and uh, review the Kansas Nurse Practice Act to make sure that the curriculum we're developing meets those requirements so that people who are issued a badge can not only earn college credit but also can earn contact hours for relicensure. Um, as far as workforce, um, I participate in our Workforce Alliance um, meetings, Workforce Alliance Board meetings, and I don't know about WIOA funds right now. Um, we currently are not use, utilizing WIOA funds to pay for badges, um, but I don't know that that may be an opportunity in the future, but we are working with the Workforce Alliance, the, the Chamber, uh, the Business and Education Alliance locally. Uh, and promoting the badges and, um, you know, I think there's future opportunity for that. That sounds awesome. Um, I have a question. When a student is applying for a job, or let's say we have somebody who's an incumbent worker or somebody who's been out of the workforce trying to enter into the workforce, and they've earned these digital badges, where exactly do they display them? And how do employers actually look for people who have badges? And then part of that is, how do you convey the value of badges to the individual, which is, you know, how do you 
publicize the fact that you're earning these badges and how do you convey the value to employers as well as uh, explain to me kind of like how if, if I earned a digital badge how could I get use it as a credential for either upskilling myself reskilling myself or new entry into an, another employer I'm going to take this to Mike first Yeah, so I do think, I mean, it's what you brought up is a, a critical point. Um, and so as a student, we've got a lot of socializing to do with students um, and businesses. I think if we look at digital badges as a credential, they're quite young and probably arguably still in their infancy. Um, so part of that is getting the socialization through to the learner and to the businesses um, around establishing that value and that currency. And I think a lot of that conversation happens with the business engagement and making sure that the businesses see value in it so that they're actually asking for those. I think that will prompt students to uh, claim those badges and um, take those badges more willingly. I think that, you know, as time progresses, we will see uh, students, you know, you would not put together a resume and think to leave off your um, college, you know, your college degree. I think that we will get to a point where you won't do a resume and forget to leave off your badge. But I do think that um, badges offer quite a lot of flexibility. So I've seen them on LinkedIn profiles. Um, I've seen people make um, e-portfolios on really simple website builders with links back to the actual badges. Um, and then I've seen on a, a paper or PDF putting a, a bit.ly link that would um, go directly to the badge verification and assertion. So there's lots of flexibility with it. Um, and I think we'll see kind of some norming practices over the next few years on how those are used. Thanks. And Kim, how do your badge earners actually share out their digital badges? Well, the struggle is real. Um, trying to get badge earners to accept the badges and to share them. And so, for example, since 2015, we have issued 856 badges. 284 of those were accepted. So that's a 33% acceptance rate. So obviously, there is a lot more education that needs to be done. Uh, when the, one of our students completes a badge, Credly is our issuing system, and they receive an email from Credly. Um, asking them to accept the badge and then giving them opportunities to share it uh, on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Um, very few people, even when they after they accept the badge, very few people we're finding are sharing the badge. And so we know that there is still work to be done to encourage them to share the badge. Uh, most of the people that do share it um, are sharing it on LinkedIn and Facebook. Those are the two biggest mediums for sharing. Um, when we did a survey of all of our badge recipients, um, we um, had um, only we had 38% that said they never had any intention of sharing the badge, and I don't know why. And so, uh, when we do our next survey, we're going to try to get to the root of that and determine why people aren't sharing it, um, because uh, it is a very valuable tool. Um, to, for demonstration of skills and for setting yourself apart as a job applicant. Thanks, Kim. Um, I have a question. Um, I know both of your institutions actually uh, have non-credit and credit badges. Um, and theoretically, as I, a learner earner, I could go into one of your institutions and then actually use uh, take your curriculum and use it for professional development. I know Wayne State University is using uh, digital badges at the graduate level. Um, WSU is actually using them in graduate level nursing. Uh, University of Mississippi uh, Medical Center is actually using digital badges in their um, medical training um, at the graduate level. Um, actually, I think it's at the, yeah, it's at the graduate level. Um, is there, do you think there is a need for badges used for professional development that don't come with a formal assessment like a pass or fail? Or Keep is that? Sleek. 
even in would that be valuable out in the marketplace to have a badge that doesn't actually have an assessment associated with it and i'll take this um question to mike first so basically do you think badges should actually have some type of formal assessment whether it's in the credit or non-credit side or not yeah i i do believe that there needs to be some some level of assessment um, and in my opinion there needs to be quite a lot of rigor behind it to continue to add value um, around that currency um, so I guess in short um, you know I'm not looking at badges to become participation ribbons or anything like that I think that um, if institutions are going to put their names behind it um, putting the time and effort into making sure that their credibility and some level of rigor um, behind that is a critical function. Awesome, thank you. Kim, Kim's, what's your opinion of having badges that don't have some form of formal assessment, whether it's on the credit or non-credit side? I agree completely with Mike. Um, I don't see the value of a badge that doesn't demonstrate uh, skills and competencies. Um, badges throughout history have always represented, whether it's Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, gaming, they've, they've always demonstrated a level of achievement, of knowledge, of skills. And if you don't have that tied to badges, then I, I don't really know what the value of it is. And that is not something that we will be pursuing here at this institution. Um, I'm, I also am in charge of community education, and I don't have any plans to offer badges in our non-credit community education program. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, 